Professor Butter, you, you're a world leader in community paediatrics. You've written many papers. You're on the world stage. You've influenced many people with your thinking. What is your personal professional mission in international child health? Well, thank you very much, Paul. Uh, you're very kind. Um, I work in the developing world, and I do a number of things that I do, influencing child health, newborn health, uh, determinants in my own uh, environment, uh, which have implications not only for my own country, but also for the developing world. It isn't really deliberate. In the environment that I work in now, these are things that we have to do to be relevant to our work to also inform what we do at scale by the best possible scientific evidence that underpins many of the interventions that we implement ourselves and encourage others to do. It has been quite a journey. I don't know whether you're aware, I am a card-carrying pediatrician who trained in intensive care in this country about 30 years ago before I went back. Um, and when you return to an, a developing world environment where resources are limited, uh, both human resources, materials, diagnostics, technology, you're forced to do things differently. But you're also forced to think differently. So I saw the light uh, pretty rapidly in terms of recognizing, number one, that the reach through the tools and skills that I had in a classic clinical training sense uh, was very limited, that uh, where in an environment you're dealing with enormous inequities, differences between urban and rural populations, between the rich and the poor, even within uh, urban populations, one needed to be innovative, one needed to be well informed, and to a certain extent you needed to determine your own um, path. So it's been quite a journey, it's been a great learning experience, uh, we have picked and, and uh, uh, been very careful about the areas that we work in, largely from a point of view of being uh, opportunistic as well as strategic in influencing change where it mattered. So, uh, uh, Zulfi, tell us um, how evidence-based approaches um, have been fit into your work and, and how you interact with in professional paediatrics. How important are evidence-based approaches to you? So that's a great question, and I'll, I'll probably try and answer that with a very specific example. So take uh, South Asia. Of every thousand children born in that region today, on average, uh, 50 will not survive the newborn period. Within the newborn period, the vast majority will die within the first 48 hours after birth. The reason why this mortality and associated morbidity is so high is because skilled birth care is a rarity. Most of these births take place in rural or poor communities in the hands of unskilled attendants. Uh, and the financial and health system structures cannot gear up fast enough to provide care and appropriate um, facility-based resources to the vast majority. Now, what does one do in that kind of an environment? Now, one can either continue to work, like many do, in hospitals and facilities and not reach those who need to be reached, or look at innovative solutions as to how one can address this inequity or difference. So what we discovered many years ago was that if we were to make some difference to this gap, then we needed to come up with solutions that worked for the vast majority of home births or community-based deliveries. And there you required human resources or health workers who were different from specialists or card carrying uh, pediatricians or obstetricians. So working with um, a health workforce, an alternative health workforce, which not only consisted of uh, community midwives, but also community health workers, was a necessity. Now the next question is, if you have to work with that alternative cadre, how do you just go in and start things by common sense? And there, uh, fortunately, there has been, um, uh, in consorts with our, my own group's work, a lot of effort to try and get evidence-based uh, practices into the community. So as you may know, some um, uh, 10 years ago, we very tentatively and with virtually no resources undertook a systematic review 
what existed in terms of community-based perinatal care. And what I thought at that time would be a two-page a uh, rapid quick-fire review turned out to be a 200-page tome because the more we probed, the more we found. But what we also found was that a lot of that data was not amenable to a rigorous scientific review and meta-analysis of the kind that uh, one tends to see for you know, many interventions. Over the last 10 years, we have hopefully influenced global policy to move into this area with a lot more systematic approach. A scientific inquiry, which admittedly requires prospective studies in appropriate health systems ranging from proof of principle studies to efficacy trials to demonstration projects and now increasingly effectiveness trials in real public health systems. And I think we've by and large succeeded. So today, in terms of knowing what works in the hands of alternative care providers and lay health workers, we know a lot more than we did 10-15 years ago, which in turn means that I can go to Ethiopia today or Afghanistan tomorrow and talk to the Ministry of Health and say, we know that this works because it has actually been tried, tested, and seen at scale. And that makes a huge difference to policy. You've interfaced with the Cochrane Collaboration and, and you know about the Cochrane Collaboration. Tell us how it may have been important uh, over the last 15 years in research and policy. Well, this has also been fascinating to, to observe. So uh, the Cochrane collaboration that I know fairly well started off with, with great in-depth scientific enterprise in assessing how various intervention trials work. And I believe still on the Cochrane um, uh, you know, front page, you have the, the forest plot from the antenatal corticosteroids uh, studies. I have criticized the Cochrane collaboration in the past for having had very limited topics and reviews of relevance to the developing world. In fact, for one area, we actually published that gap in relation to interventions that influence the immediate postnatal period and stillbirths some years ago. But I've seen a phenomenal change. I've seen also how the Cochrane collaboration itself is now very actively moving into difficult areas, um, uh, the EPOC group, other groups looking at how to make influence, how to influence change at scale, and how to bring alternative methods on the platform, which allow us to evaluate uh, evidence more broadly and not through the strict lens of randomized controlled trials only. I hope that in the future, there will be a lot more within the Cochrane collaboration on looking at uh, implementation research and research that specifically influences scaling up. Professor Butter, a lot of people look up to you and respect you. What would your advice be to young health professionals interested in primary health care and working in development today? I hope that there are many who want to do this because this is clearly the need for the future. Um, as you can see, both from changes being implemented in the national health system of UK also the Obama health care plan, even developed countries with relatively you know, uh, plentiful resources are looking at better ways of doing business. So primary preventive care uh, is not only cost effective, its reach is enormous. And for the developing world at large, we know full well that it is not only cost effective, that it also reaches a large proportion of population saves on a huge burden of morbidity, unnecessary morbidity and mortality. How do young people move in that area? Firstly, don't be scared. It is not a life of poverty necessarily. You will be very wealthy in terms of how you feel satisfied at the end of the day as to how you've influenced public health. But it's important to do this thoughtfully. How does one do that? I think reaching out to groups who work in that area and uh, to make sure that before you embark on uh, a journey in primary care that you have the best possible training, that you best best possible capacity enhancement uh, and collaborations with people who do this and do this thoughtfully. Secondly, I, I think it's very clear now that the best experiments in primary care uh, stem from evidence-based practice. Uh, and on that, it's not a barren landscape. There are lots of opportunities now for implementing things at scale in primary care settings with a very thorough scientific lens and the work that you're doing and your teams 
uh, implementing across a broad range of uh, health systems work, infectious diseases, increasingly nutrition, development issues, is a critical underpinning of primary care. Delighted to meet with you again and we look forward to working with you over the coming years in this collaborative research program. Thank you. Thank you.